please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Zubrin for his keynote presentation titled, The Case for Space. Welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, so um, should I just begin? Yes, that please. Go ahead. please. Yes. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about the case for space, how the revolution in spaceflight opens a future of limitless possibility. And that's a lot to talk about. Uh, the case, the revolution, and uh, the future. Um, and I won't be able to address it all in a talk of an hour or so, or frankly, any of it uh, adequately in a talk of an hour. But if you do find uh, what I have to say interesting, uh, I have a book that I've written uh, with this very same title that you can get on Amazon. And um, that can uh, amplify the points that I'm going to be able to make here uh, today. So let's start with uh, the revolution. Uh, next chart. Okay, so what you're looking at here is something that some of you may have seen when it happened, because this is not that long ago. This is February uh, 2018. This is the launch and landing of the Falcon Heavy um, uh, launch vehicle. And uh, this was just a, a remarkable thing. Uh, actually, if you know the backstory, it's more remarkable because um, around uh, 2010, uh, the Obama administration chartered a Blue Ribbon Committee headed by Norm Augustine, the former head of Lockheed Martin, to figure out if uh, a moon program was possible. And uh, they came back with the answer, uh, no, not within the financing that was being discussed, uh, because the heavy lift vehicle alone would cost uh, $36 billion dollars. Uh, to develop, according to them, and take at least 12 years to develop. Um, and uh, Elon Musk went to them and said, no, I can develop you one in a much shorter amount of time than that at much lower cost. And they blew him off. You get lost, not going to happen. But he went and did it. And in six years, he developed this system at a development cost of $2 billion, not $36 billion. And uh, the development in six years instead of 12. And furthermore, uh, the cost per launch is vastly less because the vehicle is over 90% reusable. And so what he managed to do with this was, was not only prove that it's possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that it was previously thought that only the governments and superpowers could do, but do it in a fraction of the time at a tiny fraction of the cost and even do things that they had deemed out of the question, such as launch vehicles that come back and land at the launch site. Um, these two rockets you see here are on the right are not taking off, they are landing uh, and instead of being crashed into the ocean as was previously accepted as necessary. Um, and this has set off uh, an entrepreneurial space race. Next chart. Okay. And uh, yes, you've undoubtedly heard that, you know, Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin, uh, of Amazon fame, has, has his own company, Blue Origin. And there's some other rich characters who are doing this kind of thing, uh, Richard Bransom, but not just billionaires. Uh, this, what you're looking at here, is the launch to orbit of a company called Rocket Lab, um, which is now launched to orbit 40 times. Um, and this company was not done by a billionaire with money to burn. This was done by working engineers who managed to find investors, uh, real investors, uh, people in it for the money. And they've reached orbit. And New Zealand doesn't even have a space program. And yet it has reached orbit through this entrepreneurial team. And in fact, they are preparing to send a probe to Venus. Uh, so this is a, a, a remarkable thing. Um, and, and I should add that as a cost of uh, uh, a consequence of sp SpaceX introducing mostly reusable rockets, the cost of space launch, which was steady from 1970 to 2010 for 40 years 
it hung in there at $10,000 a kilogram to orbit, almost as if that was a law of physics. Uh, since 2010, it has crashed down to $2,000 a kilogram, factor of five reduction um, in just a decade. Um, and what this is doing, this is causing a lot more people to want to do various things in space. Next chart. And uh, a whole bunch of business plans that were not feasible before become feasible once you have cheap space launch. And furthermore, there's something else helping it along, which is the advance in the electronics and cyber technologies has made it possible now to build uh, satellites that weigh 10 kilograms that could do what previously it took a thousand kilogram satellite to do and also cost um, less than one tenth as much or even a hundredth as much. And in consequence, a whole bunch of uh, a lot more launches are happening. And uh, I mean, uh, you have uh, satellite constellations being lost. SpaceX itself has launched a satellite constellation with 3,000 satellites, which is double the number of all the other satellites that were there before they started, about 1,500 working satellites uh, from everybody else. And now SpaceX added 3,000 over about the past three years. Uh, last year, they launched Falcon 9s to orbit 60 times. Uh, that's a, a launch rate of over one per week. Um, the space shuttle program, NASA's program, had hoped to achieve 40 per year, never actually got more than eight per year. And yet SpaceX has, has um, exceeded the dream of the shuttle program and greatly exceeded the reality. Now, the cheaper space launch gets, the more space launches there will be. And that then helps space launch get even cheaper because of volume. Now, furthermore, the cheaper space launch gets, the less conservative spacecraft designers need to be. Uh, from uh, 1970 to 2010, the practical wisdom among spacecraft designers was, don't use anything that hasn't been used before. See, in the 60s, you had to use things that hadn't been used before because it, things hadn't been invented yet. But by the time of the moon landing, there was a way to do pretty much anything you wanted to do in space. Might not be the best way, but it was a way. And so once you had that, you say, well, a way is the way. Uh, but now people are trying out all sorts of new stuff because they can afford to take a chance when the launch costs uh, $60 million instead of $500 million. Uh, and so spacecraft technology is advancing rapidly. Um, and we're going to see new kinds of things. We're going to see orbital research labs. This was a concept that NASA actually advanced in the 80s. They said, we're going to have the shuttle, we're going to have a space station, and people will be able to go up and down to the space station and do research on orbit, taking advantage of hard vacuum and zero G experimental conditions, which can be used for a lot of interesting things. But it, it never got off uh, the ground, so to speak, uh, because first of all, it took years to get approvals through the bureaucracy, the space station, the costs were incredible. And uh, also nobody in the commercial world really wants to do a commercial research in a lab that is being visited by people who are not part of your company. And in the case of the International Space Station, not even part of your country. Um, so that never happened, but now if, you can launch a space station for $30 million instead of $30 billion. Um, well, th that's not beans, but that's an amount of money that is well within the budget of a Fortune 500 company. So there are actually three orbital research uh, stations, projects currently funded that are being developed. Um, and, and that's just in the West. There's probably several more in China. Uh, and I should also add that anything, for instance, Musk does is going to be copied in China. Uh, there are five companies in China that have investment that are working on making uh, clones of the Falcon 9. And uh, several of them will no doubt succeed because the laws of engineering are the same for everyone. Um, 
So uh, we're not looking at a situation where one person can corner this market. Um, and uh, this is why, in fact, Musk is moving ahead right now to create uh, a vehicle he calls the Starship, which has uh, double the capacity of the Falcon Heavy, five times the capacity of the Falcon 9, and which is not partially reusable, but fully reusable. And if this vehicle is successful, we'll bring down the cost of launch by another factor of five. And so we've gone from 10,000 a kilogram to 2,000 a kilogram. We're going to be looking at several hundred dollars a kilogram uh, once Starship is flying. And if Starship works, there'll be Chinese knockoffs of that as well. Uh, next chart. And uh, this opens up the possibility of radically new kinds of markets for space launch, um, including intercontinental travel. You know, um, a few years ago, um, and for quite some time, uh, there was about 100 launches to orbit uh, every year. Uh, as a result of SpaceX cheapening things, last year there was 200, and we're headed towards 300. Um, but there are several hundred intercontinental airplane flights every hour, every hour, not every year. Uh, and if uh, space launch can get uh, a chunk of that, uh, not every run, no, but, you know, Los Angeles to Sydney in less than an hour, whatever, um, then we're talking about a couple of order magnitude expansion in the number of launches. Now, there's, and that will once again introduce mass production um, into uh, space technology, you know. Uh, the typical rocket engine, even, uh, you know, the, the rocket engines that, that are very similar to the space shuttle engines that are currently being used on SLS, these things cost $100 million each, that they, they uh, are actually less complex than a mid-sized car in terms of the engineering, uh, and yet they cost um, uh, whatever, four to five orders of magnitude more because they are being produced in numbers of ones and twos instead of in millions. Um, so as the number of launches increase, all the components that go into space launch vehicles and spacecraft will all become much cheaper. Um, now, um, there's another factor here, which is the fact that we have reusable launch vehicles will mean that very soon there'll be a secondary market for used launch vehicles. Now that has not been a thing. I mean, they just, you know, you, you, you can't buy a used Titan or Atlas or Saturn V. They, you know, they're used, they're gone. Okay, but the, you know, there's already plenty of used Falcon 9 first stages and some used Falcon heavy first stages. And, and pretty soon there'll be used starships and used Chinese knockoffs of starships um and um you know uh i actually know musk and uh he told me a couple of years ago that uh, he thought he could produce starships um for 10 million each which means he or someone doing the same thing would be able to produce them uh, sell them for 20 million each um which means that eventually they'll become available on the used market for 5 million each or even 2 million each um, so, you know, if you want to do something in space, it's pretty soon going to be possible to get a, a beater, uh, just like if you can't afford a used car now, a, a new car now, new cars are pretty pricey, uh, but you don't have that much money, uh, even people of very limited means have been able to get themselves some wheels by picking up a used car, and, um, and that's going to be possible with rockets as well. Um, uh, next chart, please. Uh, okay, so this, what you're looking here is a, a NASA plan for a moon mission. This was actually done during the Trump administration. And uh, this is, uh, I won't even go into the details here, but you've got uh, four launches per mission, about six rendezvous per mission, about four different spacecraft, and uh, just, you know, about 20 different ways this thing could fail if any one of these uh, series of complex operations had to be done. Now, why did they come up with this um, moon plan? 
if you've studied the Apollo mission, it was much simpler. It involved one launch vehicle and um, two spacecraft, uh, the command module and the capsule, and, and the lander. Uh, and um, that's because, uh, unfortunately, uh, the NASA program has become a, a vendor-driven program. Uh, not a purpose-driven program. Uh, Apollo was a purpose-driven program. It was didn't have a scientific purpose, but it had a geostrategic purpose, uh, which was to astonish the world with what free people could do by beating the Soviets to the moon, and it did exactly that. And NASA's science uh, missions in general are purpose-driven, uh, but the human spaceflight program has become uh, vendor-driven. That is, they don't spend money to do things. They do things in order to spend money. Uh, and so that leads to very inefficient plans. But next chart. Uh, using uh, these some of these commercial capabilities and adopting a uh, purpose-driven approach, a moon base could be built uh, much cheaper and much simpler. Uh, and you see... If, a, you know, you run a private company, you don't run it to please your vendors. I ran an aerospace company for 27 years. And while I made use of vendors, of many of them, uh, I, I didn't try to maximize what I spent to my vendors. I tried to minimize it. And that's what any private company would do. Uh, but the government, if it gets into a situation where it feels it needs to increase the number of constituents that support it uh, goes in the exact opposite direction. And that's why you get the vendor-driven program uh, where you're doing things in order to spend money. But if you're not doing things in order to spend money, you can make use of these new capabilities to do very efficient things. And so we will see commercial human missions to the moon. And next chart. Let's skip this one. Next chart. And Mars. Um, and of course, um, this is um, Musk's goal, and uh, it can enable human exploration missions to Mars um, and uh, ultimately uh, human settlements of Mars. Now, uh, you know, they're trying to get Starship ready for a second try at launch. Uh, and uh, once they get regulatory approval, they will do it. Uh, and this could take some more months. Uh, and my guess is their second launch will also fail, but further into the flight profile. And then they will try again, and maybe they'll succeed that time. But Musk's whole methodology is to build, fly, crash, fly again, cr crash again, each time fixing what caused the previous failure until he pushes his way to success. Um, and so uh, I think Starship flights to orbit will be a reality by 2025. And if that's the case, and you know we could have a new president in 2025, and if uh, uh, Starships are a reality, delivering 100 ton payloads to orbit, um, which is comparable to the Saturn V moon rocket, but perhaps 3% the cost because it's reusable. Um, I think, you know, President Haley will turn to her advisors and say, look, you know, this guy wants to go to Mars. Uh, he's got the ships. Uh, if we got together with him, could we have people on Mars by the end of my second term? And the answer is going to be yes. And, um, but will it cost a trillion dollars? No, we could probably do it within NASA's budget. We already have a transportation system here. There's some other things that are needed to be sure. Surface systems, surface power systems, systems for making the return propellant on Mars, which by the way is the key to a human Mars mission. Uh, Mars has got a carbon dioxide atmosphere and plenty of water, uh, ice, and you, with those two things plus nuclear power, you can make methane oxygen rocket propellant, which is the propellant that the Starship uses. And if you don't have to bring your propellant to Mars, everything becomes much simpler because that's the biggest amount of mass that you'd be shipping to Mars otherwise. So the key is live off the land. Um, methane oxygen engines are compatible with the propellants we can readily make on Mars. 
and that's how it will be done. And so once again, if all NASA has to do is, uh, you know, a few billion a year to make all these miscellaneous surface systems, we could have a public-private partnership, and we could have humans on Mars uh, within about a decade. Now, uh, it has to be said, it's not a sure thing that a uh, Starship will be successful. It could fail due to uh, a technical glitch, uh, to, uh, somebody crosses a wire, a lot of things could cause it to fail. It could fail because Musk... Uh, skates off the edge of the ice. He is a risk taker and he takes risks in many uh, spheres, the political sphere, the regulatory sphere, you name it. Um, and, or he could simply get uh, diverted into some other activity uh, like uh, Twitter. Um, but if that happens, if must should fail for any of those reasons, there's going to be a whole cohort of people behind him at this point. Uh, who are hot on his trail, duplicating what he's doing. So it will take a bit longer. I mean, if we have to wait for the rocket lab to create their own starship or uh, someone else, uh, it could add uh, another 10 years to the schedule. But we're talking about humans to Mars in uh, the somewhere between the early 2030s and the mid 2040s, depending upon how things work out. Um, but it's on its way. Next chart. And then ultimately, though, settlement, um, uh, because Mars um, is the planet. It has on it all the materials needed to support life and therefore uh, human civilization. And uh, if we can go to Mars and learn how to develop the technologies that can turn those materials into resources, because, you know, there's no such thing as, as a natural resource. It's only natural materials. It's a technology that turns materials into a resource. Okay. Land wasn't a resource until people invented agriculture. Oil wasn't a resource until people invented oil drilling and refining and things that would run on the product. You know, if you went to Napoleon Bonaparte's general staff and they were thinking about invading a country and they were trying to list the natural resources, they wouldn't have listed the oil, let alone the aluminum, which was unknown to science until 1820, or uranium. Um, Okay, these things become resources because of technology. And um, Mars has all the materials. We just need to develop, develop the technology. There'll be plenty of resources on Mars once there are resourceful people there. And, um, and once it becomes cheap enough, I mean, look, if somebody can pick up a used Starship for $5 million, a Starship could transport about 100 people to Mars. That works out to $50,000 a ticket which is not, and that's buying the ship and keeping it for starter housing on Mars or local transportation on Mars or even for asteroid mining. Um, you know, uh, that's actually cheaper in relative terms to current incomes than a trip across the Atlantic was in the 1700s. And, um, I think that um, the well of human social thought is not exhausted by the current uh, realities. I think there'll always will be groups of people that have ideas on how people should live uh, and that are different. Uh, and these people tend not to be popular with everyone else. And um, they'll wanna have a place where they can go, where they can give their ideas a spin to have their own noble experiments. Um, in some cases, they'll be wrong and their noble experiments will fail, but in other cases, they will be right and they will succeed. And in fact, and, and if they do create societies which can uh, offer uh, better ways to live or more chances for people to develop their full human potential than what was available in the old world, they will attract immigrants and they will grow. And the ones that do this the best will outgrow the rest. Um, and become the prevalent form of civilization on Mars and an example for the Earth as well. Next chart. Uh, now there's the asteroids. Uh, the main belt asteroids are rich in precious metals, uh, platinum group metals, fantastically rich actually in them. Um, however, uh, Mars 
actually has a terrific positional advantage in supporting asteroid mining compared to the Earth, about a hundredfold uh, once you work through the numbers. And um, you know the way you make money in a gold rush is not by mining gold, it's by selling uh, blue jeans to gold miners. That's why there's a San Francisco. That's why there's a Seattle. Um, and Mars will be to the asteroid miners what San Francisco was to the 49ers. And so the development of the asteroids will also uh, create uh, a commercial uh, benefit for Mars. The other, by the way, benefit that Mars will have, I can think of three sources of income for a Mars colony. One is supporting asteroid mining. Another is IP. Uh, the Mars colony will be a group of technologically skilled people in a frontier environment that forces them to innovate. Uh, and so they will. And, you know, uh, the main benefit that America actually uh, has delivered to the world has, um, well, it wasn't a spice route to India as Columbus proposed, nor was it Aztec gold as was actually obtained by the Spaniards. Um, the, 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 or, or cotton or anything. It was inventions, a horde of labor-saving inventions and uh, uh, inventions relating to transport. And British invented the steam engine. We invented the steam boat because the rivers uh, of America were its first highways. We needed steamboats. We created them. And telegraphs and uh, centrally generated electrical power, light bulbs, uh, recorded sound, motion picture, airplanes, nuclear power, computers, the internet, and the iPhone. Um, this is, um, and modern agriculture. Um, uh, the Martians will make inventions in all these areas in the IP, that is in areas of labor-saving machinery, in power generation, um, uh, in biotech, because they'll have very limited agricultural space to be forced to grow crops in greenhouses. Um, and these sorts of things will be licensed on Earth. And then finally, once you have a Mars colony, you can do real estate development because uh, land has to be developed to be sellable. And if you're there already, you can be the one developing. Anyway, let's go on. Next chart. And then there's the outer solar system. Um, now, what does the outer solar system have? It has something called helium-3. There's no helium-3 on the Earth. There's a little bit on the moon, but there's vast amounts of it in the atmospheres of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Jupiter has too much gravity to get it out of the atmosphere, but Saturn and beyond you could um, with the right uh, techno technological approach. And helium-3 is the ideal fuel for use in uh, fusion reactors. Um, now, fusion has been something with a lot of promise and but slow progress for some time. But uh, next chart, um, not due to Musk directly, but as a result of his example um, of the power of entrepreneurial approaches to space exploration, there is now a whole raft of entrepreneurial fusion power companies that have gotten funded. Uh, and we're talking about funding uh, of, in one case, $800 million, another $500 million. These are amounts larger than the US government fusion program. And these people are racing ahead using innovative approaching approaches. Um, and while the official international governmental fusion program known as ITER is proceeding at an absolute snail's pace, they they started it in 1985. They won't even turn it on until the 2030s. These machines are being built. They're being tested. Um, and I believe they will create workable uh, fusion ignition systems this decade. Um, once again, Musk is not doing any of this himself. He's not a fusion guy. But the example of um, that it was possible for an entrepreneurial team to vastly outperform the government um, convinced investors that perhaps the same was the situation with fusion, that the main problem wasn't technical, but uh, institutional. And so this is underway. And next chart. And the thing you need to know about fusion power is it's not just another way to make juice come out of the wall outlet. I mean, that is true. It could uh, and it will. Um, 
but there's more to it than that. Fusion power is a new kind of power. And just as, uh, for instance, nuclear fission uh, has just been one of many power sources for utility power, it's uniquely advantageous for powering submarines. Um, the best submarines are nuclear submarines. They can do things that diesel electric submarines simply can't do, like cruise around the world underwater um, instead of having to come up every day or two to recharge the battery. And um, similarly, fusion rockets have a unique province because a fusion rocket could get an exhaust velocity of 7% at the speed of light, uh, which means the fusion rocket could get up to about 10% the speed of light. We're talking about uh, a beginner's capability for interstellar travel. That's where this is going. All right. So next chart. And then finally, as we develop these much more powerful energy sources, and I should add, by the way, that uh, Mar Mars itself be using deuterium, which is second best fuel for fusion. Um, uh, it, it has five times the amount of deuterium per unit water as the Earth does. Uh, but people are going to want to take these worlds. And what you're looking at here is a painting depicting how Mars would look from space after it has been terraformed. OK, it will have oceans. It once did. Mars once had oceans in the distant past. Then it got cold and it all froze. The water is still there as ice. Uh, you warm ice, uh, you warm Mars. And we know how to warm planets. We're doing it on Earth right now. Not quite the right thing to do for Earth, but it's just the right thing to do for Mars. And if we were warming, doing global warming with intent as opposed to by accident, we could do a, a much more effective job. And um, humans will be able to transform Mars into um, a living world. Um, and this is really humans following the footsteps of earlier forms of life because life, the basic quality of life is that it transforms barren environments into fertile ones. It, 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 it wor Life works to make the world more friendly for it. And you know, the early earth had no oxygen in its atmosphere. The oxygen in the earth's atmosphere is an artifact of life. The soil on the continents is an artifact of life. And no sooner does any barren place appear on Earth than life transforms it into a fertile one. Think of Hawaii coming out of the Pacific Ocean, okay? Initially just bare basalt, the birds fly over and drop seeds, the place becomes lush, Polynesians show up and let loose pigs so there's something good to eat. Europeans show up and build swank hotels, so it's a nice place to check in. This is what we do. And this is what we're gonna do on Mars and on worlds when we reach worlds going around other stars, um, the odds are heavy that they will not initially be optimal for us. We will optimize them. And so our goal is not just to bring life to Mars, but to bring Mars to life. That's what this is about. Next chart. Now, why is this all so important? There's a lot of other things going on in the world today. Um, just as I might add, there were a lot of things going on in the world in 1492. Um, and many people at the time might not have recognized that Columbus's voyage was more important than the peace treaty that Britain and France signed between themselves in 1492, or the fact that the Borgias took over the papacy in 1492, or that Lorenzo de' Medici died in 14. In other words, those, if the Washington Post had been in business in 1492, those would have been the headlines. But in fact, uh, only history buffs know about them today. They know about Columbus. Well, why is this more important than uh, the, the many things that are making the headlines right now. Well, there's a number of reasons, uh, the impact of the human expansion into space. Um, and these are uh, for the knowledge, um, for uh, the challenge, for the, our survival and for the future. So first of all, for the knowledge, and this includes knowledge of nature, uh, you know, physics has mostly advanced uh, over the past four centuries through astronomy, the 
laws of physics have largely been discovered through astronomy. Uh, uh, Newton's laws come from the uh, laws of planetary motion um, and therefore classical physics. Uh, much of electromagnetism, relativity, uh, nuclear fusion were all discovered through astronomy. And there's no better place to uh, do astronomy than space. And with launchers like Starship, we will create giant astronomical observatories in space and perhaps discover new laws of physics that we are unaware of today. Exploring Mars, we have a chance to discover new biologies um, the, uh, because all Earth life uses the same biochemical system, the same DNA, RNA system of information. Uh, it's not clear that that is what life has to be. And if there's a separate origin for life on Mars and we discover it, we discover a different information system. This could open up vast new possibilities uh, for biotechnology, synthetic biology, things like this. Um, and as well as informing us about a subject that thinking men and women have wondered about for thousands of years, which is the true nature of the universe. Next chart. Okay, for our survival. Okay, uh, there's something you got to know about the Earth, which is where it is. Uh, the Earth is in space. That's where the Earth is. And like everything else in space, it's moving around under the influence of gravitational forces, which actually result in everything moving in space, moving really fast. And uh, so the Earth is currently whipping around the sun at 30 kilometers a second. And um, everything else that's going around the sun in our neighborhood is moving at similar speeds, except not always in quite the same direction. So we're playing bumper cars, okay, going around the ring with our bumper car, but traveling not at, you know, 10 miles an hour or whatever that the kids' bumper cars go at, but at 30 kilometers a second. And so when the cars crash into each other, as they inevitably do, there is quite the impact. And... Um, now you're aware that, um, of course, one of these impacts was responsible for the, uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs, um, but that was not the only such impact. These things are happening all the time. And in fact, we had a sizable one um, in December, 2018 over the Bering Strait, uh, a small, uh, uh, very small asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere and exploded there. Um, with a force about um, 10 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. Um, so that was just a few years ago. Where were you in December 2018? If you happen to have been in an airline or crossing the Bering Sea, you would have been killed. Fortunately, no one was, um, but these things happen and they're gonna keep happening. And um, unless we become spacefaring, at which point we can take control of the flight traffic. So to be clear, uh, I am not in alignment with the people who say we need to become spacefaring so that when the earth is destroyed by an asteroid, that we have some survivors elsewhere. No, we're not going into space to desert the earth. We're going into space to protect the earth because it's only by being out there that you can give these asteroids a, a nudge and make them miss, okay? If you're far enough out, even the heaviest asteroid can be nudged to miss the Earth. Uh, it, but there's no way you can do it uh, if you wait till they come here. Uh, next chart. Then there is um, the challenge itself. Uh, I believe the challenges are healthy. They're healthy for individuals. They're healthy for societies. And if you look at this, uh, you, this shows the number of science uh, graduates in the United States um, at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD levels. And you'd also actually see a similar chart in high school levels. And what you see is that it doubles or even triples in the 60s during the Apollo program. And as soon as Apollo ends in 1972, the ascent stops. And in fact, it, it goes down um, relative to the number of college students, which is continuing to increase. Um, this is because Apollo made space the great adventure. 
And what youth is all about is adventure. That is the spirit of youth. Youth wants to go where no one has gone before to do what has never been done before. And um, and what Apollo said to me, I was growing up during the 60s, is um, learn your science and you could be an explorer of new worlds. And that's what it said to millions of others, uh, mostly uh, young boys uh, at that time. And as a result, we greatly increased the number of science graduates. Now, I happen to be unusual in that cohort in that I actually ended up working in the space program. Most of the rest of them ended up working in uh, computers or synthetic biology, which is why, you know, they all have more money than me, but uh, still I had fun. Um, can't complain. Um, but yeah, the, the, the people who made the computer revolution were the little boy mad scientists making robots and rocket fuel in the basement in the 1960s. And um, the now in this day and age, uh, a bold space program would actually have a much larger impact because um, science and engineering today is uh, open to uh, women and minorities in a way that was uh, simply not the case in the 1960s. So not only would we have tons of little boy mad scientists making rocket fuel in the basement, we'd have a lot of little girl mad scientists making rocket fuel in the basement, which is sort of scary, but uh, what it means is uh, tremendous uh, progress would result from this. Next chart. Okay. Um, now then finally, there is the question of the human future. Now, the future, <clears throat> There's two futures that are relevant here. One is the far future, the ultimate future. And um, I think if we do this, then, you know, 500 years from now, uh, there will be new branches of human civilization, on, not only on Earth and Mars, but on thousands of planets orbiting nearby stars. New civilizations with new languages, new literatures, new traditions, new forms of society, uh, innumerable contributions to science and technology, literature, philosophy, um, you know, and and histories, uh, heroes, uh, creating histories of great deeds that will be used to inspire people to do even more, and and that is a vision of the future that is truly a truly grand future, and if you have it in your power to create something truly grand, uh, you should. So that's one reason to do this. But there's a more immediate need because the vision you have of the ultimate future affects what's going to happen in the near future. Okay. And uh, we live on a world whose near future is deeply under threat. What kind of threat threatens us today? Now, if I ask this question to an audience, college audience, you know, uh, three or four years ago, um, by far the majority of people would have answered, well, global warming, that's the threat. We have to do something about that. Now, I actually agree that global warming is real. Don't get me wrong. But global warming is not a threat to kill you within five years. Um, it is long, Global warming is a long-term condition, and we have to dealt with using uh, long-term approaches, in particular, in my view, nuclear power. But there's a much more immediate threat, and uh, it, it stems not from global warming, which is real, or for resource exhaustion, which is fictitious. Human resources are rapidly expanding because our technology is advancing. But the real threat to us today uh, comes from the same thing that caused the global catastrophes of the 20th century, which is bad ideas. Uh, the catastrophes of the 20th century were not caused by climate change and they were not caused by resource exhaustion. Um, they were caused by bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea that came in a multitude of forms, which is that there isn't enough here for everyone. And therefore we must fight it out with them because we have to take the resources from them or we have to kill them before they come and take the resources from us, okay? And this is the source of both world wars, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, uh, many other horrors that could be needed. This fundamental 
uh, idea that there's only so much to go around. And, uh, you know, here, the Friedrich von Bernhardi, he's the chief intellectual of the German general staff. In 1912, he writes this bestseller, Germany in the Next War, in which he says, look, you know, there's only so much here. And Eurasia is either going to go to the Germans or it's going to go to the Russians. Uh, so we're going to have to fight it out with them sooner or later. Should it be sooner or later? Let's make it sooner because we can take them down now before they have industrialized. And so two years later, they use the pretext of the assassination of the Archduke to basically launch World War I. And then, you know, quarter century later, Hitler, even more hysterical, you know, the laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live. Germany needs living space. It's all nonsense. Okay, Germany didn't need living space. Germany today has less space than it did in the Third Reich, a higher population and a much higher standard of living. Why? Not because they succeeded in taking over a bunch of other countries and killing everyone there so they could steal their land and their cows. I mean, they did some of that, but that did not benefit them at all. The, the reason why Germany today with less land and more people is a higher standard of living is not through murder and cow theft, but through the advance of science and technology, uh, which has been a global project to which Germans have made many contributions, but so have many other people, including people they were trying to exterminate. Uh, and had they been successful, they'd actually be much poorer. And yet people still believe this. And people still believe that we are competing for resources. And I happen to know, because I have spoken to them, that there are people in senior positions in America's national security establishment who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Because, well, there's 1.4 billion of them, you know, and if they all start driving cars like us, or even like Europeans, there won't be enough oil in the world. And you can bet your bottom dollar that there are people in Beijing who look at this uh, issue from the opposite side of the chessboard and think pretty much the same kind of stuff, except they have a different country they would like to eliminate. Now, if this kind of thinking is allowed to prevail, there's going to be world war. And it'll be far more devastating than the last ones because we have much better weaponry. And uh, we, we could destroy ourselves over a fiction, okay, just as Europe, you know, 1914, Europeans were living better than people ever had before in human history, and they almost destroyed themselves. Today, people are living much better than they ever had before in human history. And we are, are poised for world war. Uh, now, furthermore, you should know that this idea of limited resources is the enemy's ideology, okay? It is the ideology that supports tyranny, okay? Because tyranny is justified by the belief in the necessity for war. Here, I'll quote Hitler for you again. He said this idea of uh, perpetual progress through science, he said it was a Jewish plot to undermine the people's belief in the necessity for war. Okay. Now, it's not a Jewish plot, but it does undermine people's belief in the necessity for war, precisely the belief that he wanted to reinforce, precisely the belief that Putin needs to reinforce, Okay, the belief in the necessity for war. Now, the, we have to undermine that belief. Okay, um, We undermine that belief, we undermine the tyrants, and we undermine the drive towards war. Okay. Um, and, you know, because what point is there killing each other, fighting over provinces when by working together, we can open up planets? And that's the case for space. Next chart. And there's the book. So I'd be delighted to take questions. That was a powerful ending. Thank you so much. <laughs> much appreciated. We did have a couple of questions come in. Um, one of the questions is from Mike Gray. He asks, do you consider NASA will become less relevant in leading space exploration as companies become more efficient? If so, what do you think might be some of the consequences of the privatization of space? Okay. Uh, 
less relevant, it will remain relevant, but uh, its role will be reduced somewhat, okay? Uh, that is, uh, instead of this being a one-man show, it's going to be an ensemble cast. Uh, and the, now, but NASA can still play a critical role because some of these things, okay, commercial development of orbital space, yeah, that'll be done by the commercial people with NASA playing a minor role, okay? But if we're talking about planetary exploration and the initial stages of settlement, NASA's role will be important because in the initial stages, you know, if, if the business plan doesn't close, business won't do this on its own. Okay. It will, of course, do it if it's doing it for hire. Uh, now, the, the, the key thing here is that NASA be a smart shopper. Okay. That is, see, for the free market to function, free market's great thing is driven all sorts of progress in the commercial realm. You have to have people free to compete for the customer, and you have to have the customer free to choose. Okay, um, and to choose on the basis of merit. Okay, um, and where NASA is free to be an intelligent shopper, for instance, to choose the most cost effective, the cheapest launch vehicle that could do the given mission. Okay, then it drives the um, competition to develop the most cost effective rockets. Um, on the other hand, if NASA's decision-making process is dominated by politicians who insist, we want you to buy this rocket for this mission because it's made in my district, then this becomes non-functional. Then NASA does not help drive uh, progress in the commercial realm, okay? So the, now of course, buying the most efficient rocket also be actually benefits NASA in that they get to spend their money most efficiently. So for instance, uh, the Test Space Telescope, which is a planet finder that needed to, you know, looking for planets around other stars, um, had to be launched into interplanetary space. Uh, now the science directorate of NASA, which is the sponsor of that mission, uh, was able to choose freely um, and they chose a Falcon 9 for that mission. It cost $60 million instead of using a Delta, which would have cost $300 million, or an SLS, which would have cost over a billion and isn't available yet. The, 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 uh, so they were free. And, and, and I must say that um, the science directorate of NASA uh, tends to be um, the most purpose-driven part of NASA. In other words, they didn't land the rovers on Mars in order to give money to the airbag manufacturers. They they did it to land rovers on Mars. Now it's not completely pure. There, you know, this is a human institution and things happen and there's stuff that one could make points about. But overall, they mean business. They they are trying to do their astronomy or their rovers in the most effective way they can, as opposed to the uh, post-Apollo human spaceflight program, which um, because it has had A, a lot of money and B, no clear purpose, it becomes a thing who gets seized on by the politicians as uh, basically a, a bag of money to be fought over and distributed. And th the reason for that crazy moon mission plan that I showed you uh, earlier was because it was uh, I mean, imagine you're trying to build a house and the way you build a house is you call all the businesses involved in housing construction over to your uh, plot of land and say, okay, I want to build a house. And the guy who builds spiral staircases says, well, you got to have a spiral staircase and <laughs> so, so forth. Um, so you end up with a weird looking house that costs about 10 times more than it needed to. Um, and take sounds like it's going to be a fun house, though. Yeah, fun, quite. <laughs> um, okay, but anyway, so there it is.
Very good. We have one minute left. I'll, I'll give you one more question, but we need a real quick response to it. And that is, are you aware of any companies researching and developing spacecraft that use the propulsion system electro Gravitic, electrogravitic, as observed in the unidentified aerial phenomena UAP. No. Well, there's your answer. Well done in the time we had left. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. You've been an incredible keynote speaker. As a soil scientist, I appreciated that pull in of, of Hawaii and, and how uh, you can take basaltic nothing and turn it into soil and how that really does relate to what we would be doing with other planets. So that, that spoke to my heart. Thank you, thank you. Truly appreciate your time today. It was my pleasure. All right.